welcome everybody to TPSS um, 2023. Here we are on day three. Yay. Um, so you probably know a little bit about what, what TPS Fest is and why we're here. Um, this uh, mini workshop that I'm going to do is kind of a mini workshop, kind of a demo. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Um, Heather is here keeping an eye on chat. So um, we're a relatively small group. So if you have questions as we're going, I'm going to stop and, and try to leave room for that. But you can feel free to throw them in chat and, and those can be thrown at me. Um, I'm pretty laid back when I'm when I'm doing workshops and teaching these tools like this. Um, uh, Blake is is my Zoom helper. So uh, if you have issues and you can't get to write to me, ask one of them and they can feel free to interrupt me with things. Um, there is a shared notes doc. I won't be taking notes because I'll be presenting. But if you all are interested in taking notes, there's space to do that. Um, I believe I've already put my slide link in the notes doc section for this workshop um, so that you can follow along. But if not, uh, I have a little bitly for those two, which didn't turn into a bitly, but that's okay. Um, but yeah, so um, we're going to jump right in because I got a bunch of things I kind of want to talk about today and share with people a couple. We're going to talk about a couple of lightweight digital scholarship tools that I am a big fan of, um, some of which I've used, some of which I have ideas and grand plans for, but haven't implemented yet. Um, and I picked out three that we're going to kind of go through and talk about how they work, how you can use them, what you need to do to use them. Um, and if we have time at the end or if people are interested, if people are not, that's okay too. Um, I can kind of point people towards the resources that are there if people want to play around with these tools a little bit and ask questions as we go. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar, Night Lab is a, um, a set of open source and adaptable lightweight scholarship or lightweight digital scholarship tools. A lot of them were originally sort of designed for journalists uh, to create sort of lightweight ways to share information. Um, as a whole, there are currently um, six major projects out of Night Lab and then a couple projects in beta. Um, like I said, I'm going to focus on three things today. We're going to focus on the timeline tool, which is absolutely one of my favorites, and we'll look at some examples and talk about how that works. Um, there's a tool called Storyline, which lets you sort of do plotted points on a graph that have little cards associated with them that tell stories. There's Juxtapose, which we're going to look at today, which allows you to compare historical and contemporary photographs, anything that you have images of. Um, and that actually has a cool new upgrade in the last year that we'll talk about as well. There's a real fun tool called Story Map, which allows you to play with geography and images and video, multimedia, um, and uh, things that you have, as well as providing context information. There's a tool called SoundSight. So if you're somebody who works with audio files a lot, this is a way that you can embed audio clips, including like oral histories, directly into HTML text which can be really fun. And then there's a tool called Scene, which is for um, augmented reality. Definitely not my area of expertise, so we are not going to touch on that one at all today. Um, but I want to kind of let people know that these tools are out there. So Timeline itself, Timeline.js, is a really fun open source tool that enables you to build sort of interactive timelines. Um, so the way I sort of approach talking about these tools is you know, thinking about what we need to make a timeline. So if you were going to create a timeline, what would you need to do that? Um, and then we'll look at a little bit about how you actually do that and where you can put these resources once you've built them. Um, and then we'll talk about some of the quirks of each of these tools because they all have things that um, maybe don't work as nice as you might like or things that you should be aware of if you're engaging with one of these tools for the first time. So um, in order to make a timeline, uh, and thinking about this, you probably want to have some things that you want to put on the timeline, like points or pieces of information, data, um, and we'll look at what the different kinds of options are and how you want that to appear. Um, there are some limitations. This is not a heavyweight tool, um, but you can think about how you want to present that information, whether you want to do like large chunks of text or short sentences or bullet points and things like that. Um, timeline JS is built on spreadsheets. It's specifically built on Google spreadsheets. Most of these tools do rely on Google, which is a bit of a trade-off. Um, in my personal experience, that's been great for me because my institution is a Google Apps for Education institution, or at least we are until next summer when we will no longer be, <laughs> which has me rethinking a lot about how these tools work for us uh, and what changes we might need to make. Um, 
And then once you're, you've created the spreadsheet, you're going to want some place to put it. And there are different ways to embed this tool once you've made a timeline. Um, and we'll look at those different options along the way. And then, um, you know, but that's something to think about. What do you, where are you going to put your end product once you've designed it? Because it does need a home. So in thinking about this, um, this is the website for Timeline. It has some really great information about how to build a timeline because this is actually not too complicated of a process. Um, and it also, for each of the these different tools, there's some really great information about um, if you need help or like things you should be aware of if you're using this tool or like a little bit of basic troubleshooting. So um, we definitely have timelines that I built that are much longer than 20 slides. So I'm a little a little uh, do as maybe the website says and not as I do, but I will show you some more complicated examples of this. Um, but if you're thinking about creating a timeline, you want to have some sort of story that you want to be telling um, and thinking about. So is it a piece of your institution's history? Is it a particular aspect of some piece of history that you want to tell? Um, and you're going to be able to incorporate some different media into this as you go. So the website itself has some different examples from other people who have used this tool. Um, and as I said, the main thing to get started is we need a template. So the website for this tool, which I meant to put in chat and I will do right now, um, gives you that spread the sheet. Um, I actually already have one pulled that I will use for our example today. So if you, if you click on the link, it'll take you to it. You can make a copy of the template, um, which looks, a lot like this um, because this is one. Um, so there's some different pieces of information that you can provide. Some of it's gonna be things that you probably wanna include. Some of it may be optional. Um, there's a lot of different fields and I'll tell you about what all these things do so you can consider whether or not you wanna implement them. But well, this is one of those tools where if you can work with a spreadsheet, you can do something with this tool. Um, so the main idea is we're gonna tell this, this spreadsheet I have a date or, or date range and something happened on that date and maybe I want to attach some media to it. Um, so we have starting over here, we've got information about the year. Um, you can be super specific if you are building a timeline that is down to the year, month, day and an actual timestamp. Uh, you can also be really vague. A lot of the points that I'm putting on my timeline, uh, this one I've been using as an example, um, are just years. So you probably wanna have something because the main way that the timeline displays information is based on the field that it sees in the year. So you're probably gonna need at least the minimum, you wanna have some sort of year. There are two exceptions to that. If you wanna have like a title card on your timeline, you can not have a year. And then all the way over here, you can see I have type labeled as title. Um, and we'll see what that translates into sort of um, practically speaking in just a minute. Um, so you can have your beginning and you can always have your, your year. You can also do the treat this as a beginning year and have an ending year. Um, the display date is a really nice aspect of it, meaning if your dates are arranged, but you want this to display at a certain point in the timeline. So if I have something that occurred between 1849 and 1857, do I want that to show up in the 1849 part of the timeline? Do I want this to show up in the 1857? Do I want it to show up somewhere in the middle? Um, I can determine that. You're going to probably want to give each item in your timeline and each spreadsheet line will be its own item, um, some sort of headline. And we'll see what, again, what that translates to in real time. Um, headlines are in pretty bold text that is all capitals versus the text field that you see, which is this column. Um, and that is going to be a, kind of a more standard uh, case text. And it is not going to be really big and really bold. Um, we have options for media. So you can include links. And then the template is really nice. It gives you ex explanations of all these. So you can include things like YouTube or um, audio. You can include Instagram or Twitter. You can include images that you host on your own website, um, images that are found on public resources. Um, so pretty much anything that you can have a media link for, we'll talk about some of the exceptions to that, you can include. Um, they have made some changes to this, this tool. And also because it relies heavily on Google, uh, Google has made its own changes over time that have affected some bits and pieces of how you can use this tool. Uh, the media caption lets you, uh, the credit line lets you have a credit and we'll see how that appears. Um, you can also sort of format this in different ways. So I'll show you two different examples just so we can 
create this. And I've already created this timeline for the moment and embedded it somewhere, but I'll show you how to do that process as we go. You can have a media caption. So if you wanna have some sort of additional caption um, for that, you can. Uh, the media thumbnail field is really interesting. When we look at the timeline, you'll see that if you include an image, there's sort of a default little icon for an image. If you include a video, there's that little default icon of like a play button, but you can override those. So if you have your own custom icons that you wanna use, and I'll show you one example where I've installed one, you can do that. A um, couple more columns to go over. We have the type, which generally you can leave this column blank. Like I said, I if you want to have a title slide that appears before all of your dated content, you can call the slide your title. Um, and that will allow that to show up first before anything else. Um, there's also, if you notice in this drop down menu, an option that says era. And this is kind of an interesting little feature. Um, if you have uh, things that are happening across your timeline um, and you want to group certain things and sort of uh, in a really broad way and indicate that certain things go together, um, you can use this era feature and it will actually create a color coded element to the bottom. And I'll turn this on for a couple of these features so we can see this. And then there's a, a column that's called group. This allows you to create some artificial groupings. So if you have a lot of things on your timeline and you want some of them to be together because maybe they're about the historical context of something, or maybe they're about the legislation related to something, um, you can do some different features with this. And I'll, I don't use this in, I, I haven't used this in my sample for today, but I will show you a timeline that this has been pretty heavily implemented. Um, and then the background is one of the few places where you can do some pretty heavy, it's really one of the only places you can do some customization with a timeline. And that is a place where um, by default, you're gonna see most timelines are black text on a white background. Um, if you put a hexadecimal color code in the background field, you can create a background uh, color. So that will sort of reverse your, um, your color combinations. Um, and I'll show you an example of that too. So. Um, I started this as I use this as my testing spreadsheet when I teach workshops. Um, I also spend a lot of time working with a food and drink history collection. So the timeline, the sample timeline that I built is a little bit around cocktail history, which is one of my favorite topics to talk about. Um, so I have filled in some, some events and some pieces of history relating to the history of the American cocktail. Um, I've pulled some image files that I thought would be interesting to include. Um, I recently found out that you can include uh, Google Maps in this as well. So this, um, this example here is actually a Google Map that you'll see appear in the timeline uh, because I started playing around with that functionality recently. Um, so once I've made this timeline, uh, or I've started putting things into the um, the spreadsheet. The nice thing about this is once you've published this and integrated it into some sort of resource, you can go in and update this, this spreadsheet and it automatically pushes out updates very quickly to your timeline. Um, that's actually one of my cautionary things I'll talk about a little bit too, is just how quickly those changes can happen. So if you get distracted like I did once and walked away for 40 minutes and left like a half finished piece of text that went <laughs> out into the world um, as an incomplete slide, um, We'll talk a little bit more about that later. So as an example, I've got some lines in my spreadsheet. Um, I'm going to do a couple of things to make this item accessible. Um, and I'm going to go back to the timeline website, website to do that. So once I've made my timeline, um, they're going to give me some instructions. I need to basically make this timeline uh, published to the web. I need to make it accessible so that when I put it in something, when I install it in a website down the, bit, down the road a little bit, it will... Um, be able to serve it out. So I'm going to go to file um, and share and publish to the web. And you can do the entire document. It's only going to read the first tab of your spreadsheet. So I usually select that one, but it actually doesn't make much difference. Um, if this was not already published, there would be a button to actually click the publish. You can see it's grayed out because I've already published this. So you would click the publish button and then you close this and you grab the link from your spreadsheet. Um, you go back to our website for Timeline.js um, and then we can drop this in here. Um, there's a couple things that you can play around with at this point. If you want to make changes to this later on, you'll have to re enter the spreadsheet link in here. So if you decide that something you wanna change the width of something or um, 
play around with one of the other features, you will have to like reload this. But if you're happy with it the first time around, you will probably never have to come back to this page again. Um, so I'm going to leave the width and height as they are, but I could play around with these features. Um, again, this is a lightweight tool, so there are not a whole lot of things that you can play around with. There are some other language options. Um, you can start your timeline in a different spot. So right now I've set mine up with a title slide and then it's gonna start with the earliest point in time. Uh, but essentially you can tell this uh, tool, I don't wanna start on the first row in the spreadsheet column. I wanna start on the fifth row for whatever reason. So that would be, I think the fifth row would be the fourth, no, sixth slide because of the way spreadsheets work and the fact that there's a header column. Um, so that's just something you have to kind of configure. Do you have a title slide? Do you have a head with your header column? Just taking into account what your first slide is. Um, there's a zoom functionality, just a little bit of like how close in uh, will things display on a load. So the default is two. You can play around with that. Um, there is a tool to let you start at the end. So for some reason you want to reverse your timeline, uh, you can start at the end. And you can actually switch the navigation. So as we'll see in a minute, the timeline by default runs across the top and there's some information at the bottom, but you can actually flip that if you decide you wanna have it work the other way around. Um, and then the other one that's kind of a newer feature is when we create this link for the timeline, it's gonna give me two different links. It's gonna give me an iframe code, which I can embed somewhere in a website. And it's gonna give me a standalone link where I could just pull up the timeline as its own tab in my uh, browser for the moment. Um, so one of the new features they've added is the hashtag bookmark. So each individual point on your timeline um, can have its own link for sort of deep linking aspects. But that only works if you're using the tab separately, not if you're embedding it in something. Um, so there are some features here that I could play around with. I'm not going to at the moment because I kind of want to show you what things look like out of the box if you don't play around with everything. Um, and there's a couple of things I can do. It's going to give me, like I said, a sharing link, which is something that would open up in its own tab in a browser. And you could use that to link from a web page or some other resource. Um, it's going to give me some iframe embed code that I might want if I'm going to put my content into something. Uh, I'm going to grab both of these for the moment real quick and hold on to them. Um, actually, I have ones from when I ran this last time. So. Um, going to put these someplace real quick because I might want both of them in a second to cross-reference some things so that you all can see what we're going to do. Um, but I can also preview them. So if I want to see what this is going to look like, oops, and see, I already made a mistake. I must have touched something in my timeline that it didn't like. We'll put some start and end dates in. The fun of live demoing. <laughs> Sometimes you forget to do everything you're supposed to do. Let's see. If I go back over here, it's not going to like that because I need to re-pull my link. Why does it not like me today? I did put start and end dates in. Bum, bum, bum. Let me reload this real quick, quick. And if that doesn't work, I'll just show you some ones that I've already finished. Because like I said, the joys of live demoing. We're gonna see if this link works anyway. No, it doesn't. Okay, well, for the moment, we're gonna pretend that worked. <laughs> oh, thank you, Megan, row eight, good point. Let's see. So it looks like I've got start and end dates everywhere except where I have a title. I know why it's it's uh, it's because I used I started playing around with this era thing. I'm going to turn this off for a moment so that this hopefully will work, and then we can come back and play around with that feature. Whoa. 
one more try. Otherwise, we'll just look at a finished product. Hey, there we go. <laughs> so uh, right now, this is my title slide. This is kind of like my preview mode. So if this was in its own tab somewhere, this is what it's going to look like. Um, I've got a reference to, um, so this is what the header looks like. This is where you get that big, bold text. And then this is the text that you've chosen to, to put in there as sort of your explanation. Um, I've got my embedded um, image. I've got my little source note that says, hey, this is where this is from. You can also make this a hyperlink. I did not in this case, but you can use hyperlinks um, so that people can click on that and go to the original source. So if you're embedding this in a platform that you have digital images in or something along those lines, um, we've got some navigation down here on the bottom. Uh, so some different references. But then, like I said, my new discovery has been that you can integrate a Google map into this tool, which is a whole lot of fun. Um, you can also use the different map layers. So I just use the, the sort of um, street level one, but you can use different ones. Um, and you can have longer explanations. You can't do a whole lot of formatting when it comes to the text, because again, this is kind of a lightweight tool. Um, as I mentioned, you can customize your icons. So this is a place where I put in a custom icon rather than like the default picture icon, uh, just as something I can play around with. Um, so this is everything I've got on the timeline, but this is the preview mode. So if I like this, then I can pull these links. I know that these are links I'm gonna wanna use. Um, and then the next thing I can do is take these links somewhere and do something with them. So I have a Google site that I use for teaching um, workshops and I'm gonna grab the embed code for this particular tab. Um, I'm gonna go to my site that I use for uh, building things. I'm going to get rid of that one because I have a new one to add. Um, and in this case, I'm going to do embed and I'm going to add some embed code. And you can usually tell if it works because you'll get a little preview here, uh, particularly with Google Sites. Um, and then I can go ahead and insert this and then I can kind of play around with it. So if I wanted to take up more of my page. Um, and then the other thing I could do is put in a link to my standalone timeline. So I will grab the other link that I have, which is the um, this one. And then I'm just gonna publish this real quick. View this. So now I have my timeline embedded in my Google site that I have thrown together for teaching purposes. And again, I sort of see the same kinds of features we talked about. Um, I can scroll down and see navigate on the bottom. And then I've got that standalone link that I can click on to have this open in its own tab. Um, so with that in mind, um, this was kind of, this is the real sort of basic approach, like, cause I have just eight, eight lines in here, but I want to show you some other examples of timelines that I have, um, have worked with or things like that. So let's see. Um, let me go back to here for the moment. Um, so this is a timeline that we have here at my institution on the university's history. This used to be a static web page that you scrolled on down and there was a year and a bullet point and a year and a bullet point. Um, so we have converted this since to a, a much more um, interactive feature with this timeline. So this is a lot of the history of uh, our university, which just had its 150th last year. Um, it's pretty text heavy because it was originally a text document. Um, I'll show you another one that we built for, um, for ourselves as well. That is um, about the history of international students here on our campus. And one of the cool things we did with this uh, this existed in both a list of places that students were from. So there's sort of a map element to it. And then there was a timeline element of starting in the early years of the university. So this is a case where we use that background field, that one where I could change the color of the slide. Um, and that allows me to have this, um, this is our official uh, Chicago maroon for Virginia Tech. <laughs> um, so this is our official background, like our official maroon. And we use that as our background color. Uh, for these particular slides that automatically made this a white text on a maroon background. <laughs> yes, Mary, go Hokies. <laughs> um, so uh, 
if you change the background color, the text color just sort of defaults to whatever is more the opposite. So if you do a light gray background, you're going to get black text. If you do a darker background, you're going to get white text. So you don't have the ability to control the text color. All you can really control is that background color. Um, but the reason I want to show you this one is it does also have photos embedded. So if you look at the early history of international students, not all of the ones we have have images, but in many cases, um, we have pulled images. And in this case, we use that group tab, that group column to kind of break things out by decade for early students on our campus. So again, I was actually just consulting with a colleague the other day. This is not something we can control the color of. It's very sad that it is very light gray on light gray. Um, but again, this is a lightweight tool. Um, but you can kind of see I have other images, uh, other ones with images. So maybe yearbook pages um, and things like that, that we've integrated into this site. Um, let's see. Another project that I've been working on. Um, for several years now um, is on the history of women at our university. So we also have a timeline on women's history and you can kind of navigate through these. Um, and again, we've got a lot of primarily pictures integrated, um, but again, anything that you can link to, you can integrate. So video, audio, uh, image files, other things that might live out there on the internet that you can connect to, um, you can often do that. So um, one of the, the sort of quirks of this system is, as you can guess, this is an interactive tool, meaning these timelines are not inherently um, searchable in any way. And um, that also can create, let me go back and find another one, um, that can inevitably create an accessibility issue. So this was something that after I started teaching people how to use this tool, kind of came to the forefront was how can we make the information, perhaps not the images themselves, but the information in them more accessible. Um, so with that in mind, I've come up with sort of two different approaches to how we can make the text, at least, of a timeline more um, accessible or available. And so you can kind of do this one or two, one of these options, and you can put the, the content up alongside um, your interactive timeline. So um, the sort of one way is to go to the Google Sheet that has your timeline. So if you're looking at the sheet that we've got, um, I can say, I want people to be able to search the display date and the heading of the headline and the text. So I can copy those, I can highlight those, that content. And basically you can just do a, um, which one is it? Download as PDF. Um, and I could uh, do this as legal size if I wanted, uh, but I'm just going to do the selected cells. So I just want to have the content that I've selected um, come out in uh, essentially a PDF that I can put up online because I can make that searchable. Um, so in this case, I'm going to export this. Um, and I've got this little PDF. I don't know why this came out, but I would get rid of that page before I posted it. Um, and then I can sort of run this through tools that I have so I can OCR this and then I can have this to put up alongside. So as an example, um, I've done this with this 150, 125th timeline. So again, we just looked at this timeline, but you can see that there's a PDF version of it. Um, this is a slightly different approach, which is we've actually taken the text and converted it into like a clean Word doc. Actually, this is what we captured off the original website. So we didn't have to do that in this case. Um, this is actually option two, but the Women's History Project is what I should have clicked on. So again, we have our timeline and then we have a link to a PDF searchable. So I have highlighted the columns that I want people to be able to search. I've created a PDF, I've OCR that PDF, and then I put it up into our project site so that this becomes text searchable. Um, so that's kind of the, 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 probably the easier method is to just grab the content that you want um, and export that directly from the PDF. Option two is a little bit more work um, and it's a little bit harder to update, but it is visually a little bit more appealing. And that's what we just saw, which is having a text-based sort of thing that people can read and navigate through. Um, so that's just a little more work. You can copy and paste content out of your spreadsheet and into a Word doc or a Google doc or some sort of open office file. 
Um, you can format things the way you want that way. So you can have it be a little bit more readable. You can create clickable links. Um, so there's a little bit more work that goes into this. And if you're going to, to do frequent updates to your timeline, that's also something you might want to take into account that this is a couple extra steps. But again, both of these are sort of the end goal of creating um, something that is more accessible and more searchable in the long run. Um, don't get me wrong. Timelines are a lot of fun. But again, not once you're looking at this, there's really other than navigating it with the the sort of click through or the elements at the bottom, there's not a whole lot that you can do to search within a timeline. Um, let's see. So a couple of quirks to mention, um, you can't control the font size or color or name, so which font you choose, but you can use some basic HTML. Um, I actually did did not do that here, but I can. So if I go in, and this is a good point about updates as well. Um, as I said, things update in real time or close to it. Um, so if you spend a lot of time, if you're familiar with HTML, if you spend a lot of time with it, you can um, make a couple of edits. Hopefully. We'll give this a second. And then up this link again. I've got so many tabs open now. All of you. Um, we navigate over. Uh, you can see now my title and part of my text have been italicized. So basic HTML works in most of the cells in the spreadsheet. If you want to bold or italicize, uh, if you want to hyperlink something, um, not everything works because again, like I said, this is a lightweight tool, but there is a little bit that you can play around with. Um, also, for those of you who are not familiar with cocktail history, 1862 was the publication of the first cocktail manual in America for bartenders. This is a, a, a drawing of Jerry Thomas, the guy who wrote that book. Um, I could talk for hours about him because he's fascinating. Um, but his his How to Mix Drinks is how we think of the book. Its actual title was about this long. So classic mid-19th century book. Um, <laughs> But this was him making a drink he invented called the Blue Blazer, which involves lighting scotch on fire and pouring it back and forth between mugs, because that doesn't seem dangerous. <laughs> um, that being said, there are YouTube videos of contemporary bartenders doing this, and it looks amazing. I just don't know that it would taste very good, but uh, that's just my fun fact about that for the moment. So... Um, Another thing, as I mentioned, your spreadsheet will update in close to real time. There's a little bit of lag time as long as it takes, you know, very often the way that, that uh, Google Sheets works is you make a change, you click on another cell and you get that little, oh, I'm updating or this has been updated. Um, so about as long as that takes plus a few seconds for your timeline to update is usually how much time you've got there. So if you're working on writing something, it's probably not going to update right away. If you stop something and walk away, it does mean it could update in the middle of a particular phrase or a particular piece of text that you're writing or something like that. Um, so that's just something to be aware of. It's both a good thing and a bad thing that it updates in real time. And then one other quirk that I learned early on, if you have an empty row somewhere in your spreadsheet, so if I if I stuck an empty row in the middle here, um, sometimes the timeline tool thinks that means that's the end of your timeline. So if you ever go to a timeline, if you're loading up a new timeline, if you're setting setting up a new one uh, and you get, you know, partway into it and then you don't see anything else, always check to see if you have a blank line first, because one of my first takeaways, I thought I had lost like half the contents. Um, turns out I had not. I just had an empty line and uh, the tool thought, oh, we're done. We've shown you everything there is to see. Um Okay, so I'm gonna hit the pause button there and see if people have questions about this tool. Um, I can show you other examples. I'm happy to like dive back in and show people something specific if you want me to, to change something different in the spreadsheet um, and see what that looks like, please feel free. But if you have questions, I'm gonna take a pause, take a drink and give you all an option to ask those. Oh, the other thing I wanted to show you was what this can look like in different kinds of things. Um, I also have, so I showed you, um, this is what it looks like in our Omeka site here at Virginia Tech. Um, I showed you a little bit, this is what, um, this is what an example looks like in just a little test Google site page that I've built. 
Um, so a kind of basic thing, we've got your standalone tab, um, which is really nice. And I wanted to show you another one. Um, so I've been consulting on this project. This is not my project, but I've been consulting on this project. So our cooperative extension recently had their history. Um, it had a big celebration and they've been diving into their own history. So they have been working for a couple of years on a timeline. Um, it's a little condensed in their website. So we're going to open it up in another tab. And you can see they have created, again, these groups. So they have like historical context or uh, Virginia Cooperative Extension History or land grant institutions. So things that show up on those lines mean that that column has been applied to them. So everything on the top column is, is historical context. Um, so they had a number of students and grad, undergraduate students and grad students. Um, all working on this project for several years. And now somebody new has taken over. So I was just meeting with that person this week. Um, sometimes links break. So, so sometimes that's a side effect of things we get to deal with. Um, so creating a timeline is not a one and done. There's probably some maintenance that's gonna come out of that if things like links change. Um, I wanted to show you this one because they've also embedded uh, YouTube. So they've got a link to um, an, a future homemakers of America um, segregation issue video. Um, so they've in, they've they've included different formats again, um, and they have put a lot on their timeline. So I know Timeline JS says maybe don't put more than twenty points. We have some pretty dense timelines. Um, Cooperative Extension has done that. So you can have a dense timeline. You can have timelines with lots of points. Um, it's just a little more maintenance and work that maybe you're putting in. Um, I will say, Rachel, to your comment, this is actually a really great tool. I have not gotten to use it in a class yet, but it is a tool that I think it doesn't have a huge learning curve since it's spreadsheet based. So it would be one that could lend itself to like classroom integration um, or having some sort of role in the classroom because you could teach students if you have more than one session with them, probably how this works um, and have them doing research to fill something out and contributing to that. Um, I've had students that work in my department help us with timelines in the past as well, um, or start building them from resources that we had. So we've had student um, engagement with these kinds of projects too. Uh, so the next tool we're going to look at is a little bit easier to use. So let me close some of my timeline tabs, which is not to say the timeline is difficult, but um, this one's a pretty even, even lighter weight tool. Um, Juxtapose basically lets you do um, one thing. It lets you compare similar media, uh, primarily photos. So if you have a historic photo and a new photo, maybe that you want to put side by side um, so that people can see what, what something looked like, or if you're doing like sort of before and after um, stories that might show the outcome of a single event, um, Juxtapose is a really great tool for that. It has a little tiny interactive element to it that we'll see. And they also did a new element to this more recently that actually allows you to create uh, some sort of actually like active um, elements to it. So we'll see how that goes <laughs> in just a minute. Um, so what you need in order to play around with Juxtapose, and this is another one that would lend itself to in-class use because basically you just need two files and the website which is really nice. Um, you wanna have publicly located image files and they've got some asterisks there that we'll talk about in just a second. Um, again, we're gonna need the Juxtapose website from Night Labs um, in order to make some code. Um, and then we're gonna need once again, a place to put this once you've made something. So basically um, I can, um, we're gonna have two options. We're gonna be able to create like an interactive um, sort of, two image thing with a slider and there's gonna be some different options. And this is the new feature. They've created one that's like fully animated on its own, um, which I think is kind of cool, but then I created one and I realized just watching this thing flip back and forth got, <laughs> got a little frustrating. So I might use that aspect of it sparingly, but you can take two pieces of media and you can compare them. So, um, for we're going to do just an interactive one for now. Um, they have some examples here out of the box if you want. Um, I uh, let's see, where are my test images? I have test images. Um, wait a minute, I'm gonna go back and double check something. Okay. Um, 
So I often pull things from an Omeka site that my colleague and I have for workshop testing. So let me jump over here real fast. Um, so this is um, the previous library building, uh, to, previous to the building that I am currently sitting in um, at my university. And so I'm gonna put this one in and, uh, cause that's fun. And then uh, I'm gonna grab another historic image of our library. Um, so that, that building that I just showed you was the previous building. Um, that building caught fire in the early 1950s and this was the immediate aftermath. So I kind of use this as one of my options. Um, you can put labels on these photos. So you could put the year um, that these two photos came from and then it will pop up a label. You can make that label longer. You can put credits which uh, we often like to do. And I won't much watch you type my whole in department title because it's too long. I'll just use a short version for today. Um, so uh, I can put in my images. Um, I can do some different things. I could say, I put in these labels. Maybe I don't want to show those labels. Maybe I change my mind. Uh, I can show the credits, which will show up at the bottom. Um, you can do the animated feature. Uh, or not do the animated feature, which we'll play around with that in a little bit. Um, and then you can have it be responsive. So if you are going to embed this in a website and you want it to respond to changes in the size of the browser, you can do that. Um, and there's also an option for vertical. So uh, I'm doing a, a horizontal right now, but if your images maybe made sense to flip the other way, you can actually have a vertical. And I understand, I, I fully uh, admit that I did not match my file sizes. So these images are not perfect. Um, they're close, but not exactly the same size. If you're, um, and the nice thing about this tool is it actually tells you that. It'll say, hey, um, one of your photos is a little bit different from the other. They don't have the same aspect ratio. You might want to pay attention to that um, if it's something you're concerned about. I'm not going to watch you all, uh, not have you all watch me crop photos today. So we won't worry about the original dimensions at the moment, but they do give you some warnings. So I've kind of set myself up to make some decisions. You can also start the slider um, further to like the right or left if you want it or top to bottom, depending on the circumstances and how you want to do it. I'm going to leave it in the middle for now. Um, and then I'm going to click publish. And as soon as I click publish, much like the timeline, it's going to give me a sharing link that I can use. And then it's going to give me some iframe code that I could embed somewhere if I wanted to. Um, so we'll do both of those things. Um, I will go back to my fun little test Google site and I can do, uh, some embed code. Uh, and if I click that again, it's going to preview it for me. So it's going to tell me nice job. This is what you're going to see in just a minute. And again, I can sort of within Google sites, at least I can play around with the way I want that image sized um and how I want it located and then I'll do another text box with the link so you can see the other other option uh, just real quick dun, dun, dun. So if I go look at my page, um, it obviously, I didn't make this as big as it could be. So I've got to scroll a little bit to see things. That's something I might go back and correct. I would probably play around with my website. So more of this was visible. Um, but again, people can go in and interact with this. Uh, and then the direct link is also really big. So that's something to, be, <laughs> that's something to take into consideration. One of the quirks of this tool, um, if you're going to use the link to just this image or this set of images to allow people to navigate, it does tend to be a little bit large. Um, again, it is responsive, so it should get smaller, but maybe it won't with that one. Maybe it's only going to do it on my website. Um, so there's a couple of different things to play around with there. Uh, we can also do this, as I said, um, with if you want to do the sort of interactive um, GIF element to it, then you do need to either provide the links or upload your images. Um, and that will create that sort of interactive element. And let's see. Quick, grab that other one. I didn't save all the links I needed.
And you don't have a lot of customization here. All you can kind of do is add the images and then you can generate your preview. Dun, dun, dun. Building up some intensity for us. Um, so then I can just download this and I can put this out on social media. When I did find out about this, I was really excited. I immediately made this and then put it like out to my library. And I was like, look, <laughs> and everyone was like, here is way too excited about this. But um, so there's not nearly as much to control here. And the best you can do is download this. You can't necessarily embed it directly into a website. So that's again, why they point out like this is better for social media. So if you want to do something like this to add to one of your social media accounts to put out there, it's definitely an option. Um, I guess we want to meet people where they are these days. Um, so a couple of different options. Um, the one thing to think about with juxtapose, because I put these two little asterisks, right? We want to have links to a publicly publicly located images, whether they live on someone else's website or on your website or someplace that you can provide access to them. But that comes with this asterisk. Um, so juxtapose will work with files that live in Flickr. It lives with it works with files that live in Dropbox. It works with things that are in Omeka, uh, Wikimedia Commons, OneDrive. Um, pretty much any image from a website there in which you can view the image in its own tab or browser, except, uh, as you guessed, not Google anymore. Um, so a couple of years ago, Google made some changes. Google Drive made some changes to the way that it presents uh, image files or video or audio files so that the image does or the, the file does not end with the file extension. And because it doesn't end with the file extension, um, Night Lab tools aren't prepared to handle it. So there's no obvious fix for that. Um, it's a real bummer when the tool first came out, it did work really well with Google Drive. It does not anymore. Um, apparently it does also work with box.com. That's not one I've tried. Um, there are some quirks to that, but you can make it work. And in theory, there are ways to do some advanced customizations. If you know JavaScript and markup, um, you can also play around with the iframe a little bit if you are again familiar with how to do that kind of work. Um, so you can play around a whole lot, but Juxtapose is again, a really, really lightweight tool um, that's not meant to have a whole lot of customizations, but it can have some pretty neat outcomes. Um, like this, <laughs> keep coming back to this lovely little interactive um, element for us. So you can see, I used to have a folder full of images I used um, that were in Google Drive and now they don't work anymore. Sad face. Um, so, and I think the other thing I can show you is, uh, I'll take my embed code. So the other place that I often show people, cause I also teach workshops on Omeka, um, includes, incorporating things like this into Omeka. So I can show you um, if I wanted to do something similar, I could go back into, or I could go into my site here. Um, I could create a new text block for those of you who work with Omeka. Um, I can do some source code uh, and I can insert this into a thing that I'm working on. Um, frame width height, I'm going to make this a little taller just to show you the kinds of things you can play around with. Um, save this, I'll go to my public page. Again, you can see a different version of the timeline that I used in a previous workshop. Um, this is Storyline. We're not gonna work on this tool today, but this is one where you can sort of tell stories over time uh, with points on a graph. We're gonna talk about story map in just a little bit, but now I've got my little image embedded into my Omeka site that people can play around with as well. Um, so again, anywhere that you can put uh, juxtapose specifically, any place that you can put embed code um, or iframe code in particular, you can incorporate juxtapose into what you're doing. Um, okay, I'm going to take another pause if people have questions about that one or if you want to see anything else before we move on to the last tool I was going to talk about today. Okay, so the last one we're going to talk about today uh, is Story Map. So Story Map is a fun tool that sort of lets you tell stories online by highlighting locations. 
So you can use uh, maps that already exist out in the world um, and a whole bunch of different features. So this is the one where you get to play around with a lot of different aspects of how this tool works. So there's kind of two options for how story map displays. One is sort of location-based. So each point in your story is gonna be on a map with like lines connecting them. Uh, or you can go a little more image based so you can use photos, art, maps and other images to sort of uh, be the, the highlight of each point in your story. So if you want to use story map, what do we need? Surprise, surprise, we need something with locations for a story that we want to tell. Or we might have a series of images that we want to use to tell a story instead. It could actually be elements of both. Um, and then once we build all this, we're going to want to have a place to put it. Um, Storyline, much like the other tools, is dependent on Google very specifically, and you'll see how in a moment, not just being able to have access, but um, it's actually going to use your Google account to see to save your story maps for future use. Um, and you can see this has a lot of different options because there's going to be a lot of different, different, different aspects of this and customizations we're going to be able to play around with. Um, close a few more tabs here that we don't need. Um, Okay, so story map. Um, story map is one where, again, they kind of recommend maybe not having more than 20 slides to click through. I might agree with that in this case. I know I have a tendency to have long timelines that have a lot of interactive points, um, but this is one where you're going to kind of be visualizing things on a map. So a whole lot of points beyond a certain point may be a bit of an overload. Um, also, they make a good point that maybe you want to have a location narrative so that when people click on a map, they're not bouncing all over the globe. Um, so some things to think about. Um, and again, we're going to be able to incorporate a lot of different media into this as we go. So basically, there's not a whole, we're not going to drop things into links and produce something here. We're just going to go back up to the top and say, make a story map. Um, and this is where I said, you do need a Google account for logging in. So this is how you can hold on to your projects. So everybody, everybody's watching me log in. That's okay. So I have some, some ones that I have played around with. Um, and I'm, we'll close that. We can come back to these in a minute. Uh, for now, I'm just going to say new. And we'll work from the timeline we were working on before. So um, I'm looking at all kinds of options here, right? So right now it's it's just showing me a blank black and white map. Um, I can pull up the options here. I can already, I could play around with the height of the map. I can play around some different things. Do you want to do this as a map? Do you want to do this as a series of interconnected images? And we'll play around with that a little bit. Um, this call to action is a way to sort of have a first slide, so much like we had the title in the spreadsheet for the timeline, you could have like a landing slide or a starting point. Um, this is where you get to pick your map. So there's a bunch of different options and you can change this once you get started in the process as well. I'm gonna pick this one because I love it, but, <laughs> but we'll, we can always come back and we'll look at what a different map might look like later. Um, there is a button for sharing. So when you are maybe ready to do some sharing and you want to be able to incorporate this, um, we can come back and look at that. But for now, I'm going to, you can also pick totally different fonts. So this is one of those places where you can play around. Uh, I'm going to pick a different font just for fun too. So um, at this point, we have a bunch of different things going on, kind of like the timeline. There's a headline feature. So you're going to have like some sort of bold, um, uh, some sort of bold feature to it that's going to stand out. Um, and then I'm just gonna, uh, just gonna put a little thing together. Um, and again, you can kind of play around with HTML. You can hyperlink things here. Um, you can start to play around with background options. So do you want your background to be white? Do you want that background to be a different color? You can replace the background. Um, it doesn't have to be a color. You can make it an image, um, either one that you've uploaded to your story map folder or one that lives in a public website. Um, let's see, let me go back to my main page here. Um, and we'll borrow. This doesn't have anything to do with the timeline I'm putting, the story map we're putting together, but that's okay. Um, there we go. Um, 
So, and then I can add media to this point. So right now what's going to happen is I'm going to make a new slide. So like this is sort of my landing slide, which doesn't have a location attached yet uh, because this is kind of my landing spot. Um, so I'm going to do... Oops, wrong button. Um, I have, let's see. I'm going to pull up an image real fast that's in a WordPress blog that I have that I can use as well. Actually, that didn't work the other day, so I won't do that. Um, let's see. I'm going to use media that is not necessarily appropriate for what I'm doing, but um, and this guide was published in New York City. So I've got this bar that's allowing me to pick a location. Uh, on the watercolor map, this location looks really cool. Um, I could do a credit line again. So, and I can put a caption, even though, again, uh, these things are not necessarily related. Um, that's okay. I also have marker options. So again, there's sort of like a default marker for the type of media that you use, um, but you can also replace that with something that you want to use on your own. Um, I'm gonna add another slide. Let's do... So I'll pull a video this time. And I mentioned there are good uh, videos of people making blue blazers. Uh, so I'm gonna grab one of these real fast. Um, integrate this. Um, uh, nope, I keep clicking on the wrong one. And I'm going to leave the background alone for this one. I don't want to play around with it too much. Um, so I've got like three slides in, which is a good start. And we're going to click preview. Um, it's going to show me the slide I'm on. So I'm going to jump back to the first one. Let's see. First one, preview. There we go. So we can see I've got my little header that I've put in. Um, I have my background image that I chose, which like I said, has nothing to do with this. Um, and I can already see some points on a map with the line between them. So I can start exploring. It's going to take me into my map um, and it's going to have my header and my information that I've shared. It's got this little image file, which I'm seeing. The next one's going to take me to this video, which I can click and play. Um, and so basically story map lets you build out this kind of story. You can go back to the beginning. So if you, and this is again, sort of the preview is the user experience mode, right? So if you click through and then you go back to the beginning, that's something that they're gonna see. You can go, um, if you go to a different slide and then if you go to map overview, it will sort of pull back out and show you all the points on your map. Um, I'm gonna go back and show you a map that I've already built so that you can see uh, a slightly larger example of this. Um, as I said, I do a lot around food history. So I also did a map around the, started building one on mince pie, um, which has a fascinating history. So this one's a little more global, um, starting in Western Europe uh, and then jumping over to uh, uh, the 1630s. Um, and then we gradually make our way uh, to the US um, in thinking about the history of mince pie. Um, let's see, I think this is another one I did, which was talking about food history in general. So I just kind of jumped around again. Like I said, I do a lot with food history. Um, so we're talking a little bit about, start thinking about bread and sort of the travels of that coffee and sort of the origins of that. So I included a video. I started to get into snack cakes. Don't get me started on the history of Twinkies. Um, <laughs> and then I was thinking about oysters. This is a trade card from one of the collections that we have here. So again, you can sort of build these out to do a lot of different things uh, and a lot of bouncing around. And again, you can always kind of, um, when you're in edit mode, you can always revisit the options. Um, so I could change my fonts on this particular map and it would update. I could change the map type that I've used. 
I could make this bigger or taller. I could change the width or something like that. Sorry, Blake, it is lunchtime for me. So now I'm thinking about all of the <laughs> Um, so the one you've got some stuff on your story map that you're ready to share, there is a share button up here. And this is where you can grab a link that you can use. Um, if you have unpublished changes, so if you've made updates, it will tell you, by the way, you might want to click publish changes um, so that that's something you can do. Um, let's see. And then... Um, do, 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 do. So again, we've just, um, let's see. So, please log on social media story. Yeah. Oops, that's not what I wanted. Um, so I'm going to grab this link for a second because this is the link that we want to share. I'm going to go over to my test site and I might have left my colleague. Nope. Yes. So my colleague, last time we taught this workshop, she was teaching this tool and she had a lot of fun. Uh, we'll view the published version of this. Um, we are very food driven people. <laughs> so we spent, she did her whole story map about, uh, the best donuts in America. So she found a list of donut places, uh, and started putting together this map of, um, different donut places. So I will tease you all with donut pictures. Um, but again, it's the, the map sort of lets us travel around and look at, um, different donut places. This is our lovely little donut place here in Blacksburg, Virginia, Carol Lee. Uh, which is infamous. Um, so again, we sort of um, took this map, we put it into our website. Um, let's see, I will do, oops, that one's in draft mode. That's why it didn't like that. You don't, yep, there we go. So I was still working on that one. That's why. So as soon as I updated my changes, there's, this is just a direct, direct link to the story map. Um, you can actually click out and share it on social media right from here. You can select a featured image. So if you had a particular image from your um, your project that you wanted to be the feature for social media, you can do that. But again, once I publish it or once I've updated the fact that I have changes, um, I can grab that, grab that embed code. Um, so I'll grab this. That's what I was looking for before. Whoops, I gotta do this as embed. Nope. And again, it'll sort of preview it for you so that you can see you're you're working with um, what you expect to see. Uh, and in this case, I can play around with that a little bit in my Google site. And I'll publish this again real fast. Uh, and then you can view this. Um, and again, now I've just got this built into a site so someone can navigate um, one of my story maps. And it works much the same with Omeka. Once I've got that embed code, um, I've got a site, you know, that we, I'm pretty sure we already have in here. Let's see. Um, yeah, so we'll go to the public page. Um, and I'll show you real quick. This is again, my, my colleague's donut map, which is a really good one. <laughs> um, how does it work with hyperlocal? That's a great question, Heather. Let's play around a little bit. As I remember, it handles it pretty well. Um, I've not specifically built a, a map around um, uh, VT history particularly. Um, I don't know why I have this label this campus because it's definitely not. Um, let me, let me start a new one. I know, I know my neighborhood, my community really well, my campus really well. So, um, and I see that there's a question from you too, Blake, that I will come back to. Um, I'm just going to do a standard map here. Um, So it doesn't recognize my building, uh, but it does know my address. Okay, so this is our building. Um, um, let's 
save and then the only thing the one of the things that I don't love about this tool is you can zoom in and out on the map so if you want to navigate to a space you can do that but it doesn't just you have to kind of click the buttons in the corner um And it does require, like, you can enter coordinates, but um, it's not built on Google Maps, which is, again, kind of an interesting factor because Google Maps knows a lot of things. Like, Google Maps knows when I'm searching for Newman Library that I'm searching for 560 Drill Field Drive. This tool that it's built on doesn't know that, doesn't know a building name, for example. So if you want to get super local, you might need to rely, you're going to need to rely either on street addresses or latitude and longitude. Um, so you can do that hyper local. It's just that it's not as straightforward if you don't know like street names and street addresses. Um, so it's a little bit trickier, um, which I think is a slight downside because I don't walk around with a cat like a list of latitude and longitude of buildings on my campus in my brain, and probably many of you do not either. Um, so again, it just it requires a little bit more searching. Um, And um, I'm going to hit pause on this because I see we have questions coming in. So yes, you could do hyperlocal. I think it just requires a little more work because it's not built on Google Maps. Um, Blake, yes, I believe there are the same issues for um, Story Map because again, it's just built on a tool. So um, there is going to be that same searching and accessibility issue. Like you can't search within a Story Map for a particular slide or a particular element or even a particular word that someone may have mentioned. Um, so if you you could do something similar, I've not played around to create like what would essentially be a text guide to your Story Map. I feel like that would be the way to address that accessibility would be like, what could you take the text from the, the slides that you've built into your map and use those to create sort of a play-by-play -play of the, the tool? Probably, um, I think it would be a way to approach that. But again, these are not designed, these tools were not necessarily designed with accessibility in mind. Um, Michaela, can multiple Google users collaborate on a single story map? Um, I'm trying to remember. That's a good question. I don't think so. I think that's one of the downsides of this one is you can't like add another person. Um, let me leave this map for a second, uh, but I'm gonna double check on that. Rename, no, so there is not. Um, so I'm not aware of a way that you can do that. Um, I think this is kind of a, a, it's not designed as a collaborative tool. It works, the timelines you can certainly collaborate on because it's spreadsheet based. Um, and story map or story line rather, which is the other tool that we didn't spend, we're not gonna dive into, although we could look at it. Um, story line is also built on a spreadsheet and would allow you to be collaborative, but story map, um, unless you were working off of a shared Google account, I don't know of a way that you'd have multiple users contributing to that. Um, Sarah, you raised a great point. So to reduce broken links, especially for YouTube, is there any value in archiving those pages using Internet Archive and linking there instead? Um, yeah, I think so. I think that could be a great potential. Um, the, you know, we all know that the internet is transient. Um, and like, you know, Omeka is a great exhibit system, but it's not a preservation system. It doesn't have permanent URLs. So um, that's something I think we face with a lot of systems. Um, I think Internet Archive could be a great resource. I know um, I tend to default to like maybe Wikimedia Commons for images and things like that. But basically anything that you can get a link to, you can use. Um, and that would sort of work. Um, so would it work with embedding the GIF of Juxtapose? Oh, um, I do know, let's see. So I think you can embed a timeline in a timeline, which was very meta and that kind of blew our minds. It doesn't look very good either, but you can do that. Could we, okay, so that's the question that we're gonna ask now. Here, I, I'm just thinking like if you did like a then and now map, like a on your story maps, but then had like that little slider tool as your media element. Let's see. Now I want to go, where's my juxtapose? This is the high frame. Hmm. 
Um, whoops, no, cancel that. Can I do this? Let's see. I have the link from, yes, we can. Yes, we can. <laughs> Let's save this and then we'll preview this one. Um, I think I was playing around with this one and I changed the language. So that's why uh, it is not in English. Uh, but yes, so now we know we can put a juxtapose in a story map. We can put a timeline in a timeline. We could probably put a storyline in a story map. Um, ooh, this is, we're crossing the streams. Now I'm gonna have to like work out for the next time I teach this workshop, like a grid of which tools can be embedded in which tools and which ones we know can't. <laughs> Um, Jody, you were asking, can audio only files be used as the media file in story map? I believe so. Um, let me try to find. Um, let me try something. Google Google Drive again may not work because it's a little bit um. Actually, let me go here. I'm going to find one of my oral histories. Not in this one. Let's try this. I'm going to pull an oral history from one of my collections. And we'll preview this and see. Changes. Let's preview this. Okay, it didn't like that link, but I have another idea. Again, it really likes these sources really like direct links. So if you're working with audio and video files, my thought process here is I am going to look at an oral history um, in order to get the direct link to the audio file. And I'm going to see if I'm going to see if that works. So sometimes the key is having a more direct link to something. But it may not. Let's, let's try to see. Do not like only audio. It may not have a built-in audio player. So unless you're linking to something that already has a built-in audio player, that may be the problem I'm bumping into. I'm really intrigued to try and troubleshoot this now, but I may not be able to come up with an answer for you on the fly, Jody. Because <laughs> I think there might be, there probably would be a way to do it. It might just take a little bit of poking around and figuring out what your options are for having um having that playback happen so like google maps like in theory i have this in a tab right now which on its own will play if i click play but there's not an inherent audio player so it'd be a question of like what kinds of audio what kinds of tools are you using to present your audio only and then how do they feed that out so right. it'd be an interesting question <laughs> you, you mentioned that you could do youtube right Yes. So you could, in theory, upload your audio with like a picture background. Yep. And then do it as a YouTube video. You again. could definitely do a YouTube video. Um, you could um, probably up. Oh, no, that's images only. So you can't do that. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah. So it could definitely work with YouTube. Um, it might just depend on the audio players that are out there. Like we put our stuff in Omeka. So that's where I'm defaulting to. But I could maybe there'd be a more and, and I know that Google Drive doesn't work as well but I wonder if something some of the other tools that integrate with these would work in alternatively like Dropbox or something like that it might be interesting to see like which tool SoundCloud's a good example that's a really great example that might work um as well alternatively you might be able to do something again combining tools I haven't tried this but SoundSite which is one of the other tools here is a way to embed audio into HTML text, 
I don't think that would quite work though because you can't link to that piece of text. But yeah, I think if you had a place that was better designed to serve out audio like YouTube or SoundCloud, um, you could probably incorporate audio only. And you could even upload an image here to just have a static image alongside it or behind it or something like that. Um, one thing, so I'll mention a couple of the, the quirks about story maps before we, we leave that. Um, so again, it does require a Google account um, like other Night Lab tools, uh, but it is a great way that allows you to save your work. Um, again, ironically, story map no longer works with images hosted in Google Drive, and I think it would be the same for audio hosted in Google Drive. Um, Dropbox does work. You have to tweak the image a little bit, the, the URL when you paste it, but it will work. Um, and another fun one about story map that I didn't play around with, um, you can actually start at a specific slide. So kind of like the timeline feature where you could say, I want to start on a different row. Um, each of the, um, the slides in the story map have their own um, hash, they all have their own link. So you can actually encode that into your iframe to say, start on this tab or start on this slide as opposed to starting at the beginning. I'm not really necessarily sure why you'd want to do that unless you were linking to a specific section of a specific story map from a specific site, but that is a functionality that exists if you are interested in pursuing it. Um, so other questions about these tools or is there something somebody wants to see more of or um, look at another one? Uh, I mentioned the two other tools that are out there. We could look at one of those if people were really interested. I wasn't sure how much, how the timing would work out today. Um, I'm going to grab a drink real quick. If people have more questions, feel free to shout them out. Um, otherwise I can like, um, I have the slides that, um, can be shared and I've put in the notes. One thing I'll do for the group notes for TPS is try to put the link to Night Labs in there so that you can go in and play with all of these tools yourself. Um, again, they are designed to be sort of lightweight and relatively easy to use. Um, and that allows for sort of a lot of different partic participation at different levels. Um, and I really, I haven't done as much with all of these tools as I would like. I have grand designs for many of them, um, but I'm sure um, as, as many of you can appreciate, we don't always have the time to work on all the projects that we want. <laughs> um, If anyone has additional questions for Kira, you can drop them in the chat and I'll read yeah. them or you're welcome to unmute and talk. Oh, no, Jasmine, I actually didn't dive into that too much. Let me pull up. I think I have an image based map um, that I will pull up. Um, and there's not a whole lot of difference. Um, it's really kind of subtle things. So let me go back because I have two examples of this. So on my one mince pie one. <laughs> You can see um, it, there's sort of lines connecting things. And if we preview this, do, 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 you can see there are lines connecting the images on the map. Um, and we can sort of, as we navigate through, it sort of addresses those different things. If you're like less concerned about map and more interested in content, um, I put like a starting, uh, I put a background image on this one again. Um, Let's see, you uh, you get a couple of different things here. So you get a little like map in the corner, um, which kind of is your, kind of works with your um, navigation through the, the spaces themselves. Um, and there we go. Um, so you can, you kind of get a different way of presenting the information, which is kind of what the, the image based thing, it's not, you, the other the other way that the other way to think about this being image based is um, let's see uh, it, there, that that I haven't done a whole lot of custom work on. So the other element here is that you can do custom. So basically, if you are more interested in the the images telling the story, you can leave you can use the coordinates but you could also kind of forego using the coordinates and do custom images instead of your your maps um so i don't have a good example of this because i haven't built a really detailed one um i'm double checking because i designed this one that i said it was an image story and now i'm wondering if it actually is 
it is image. Okay. Yeah, I think really it comes down to the when you're actually interacting with the item, what being an image story, it has different elements to it. So it has this like little navigation sort of orientation thing going on that you can't really do much with, but it sits there. Um, yeah, it is pretty subtle. And the other option, like I said, is to is you can take this to the next step, which is by choosing the image layer, um, you can customize every background. So if you don't want to deal with maps at all, you could have uh, an image that's behind here. And I'm going to see, let me pull one of my, um, I'll pull an item real quick. No, not that one, because nobody wants that something totally different. I'm going to use this and we're going to see what happens. Whoa, that's wild. So, <laughs> so this gets into some new territory. So if I change, I can change this background completely. Um, and it's going to, apparently it's going to tile my image as we're now learning. Um, the other thing I remember being one of the weird differences about the image part, and I'll go back because now I'm remembering it, um, is, oh, it changed it across the board. That's really wild. I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> Um, okay, let me edit that again, back out so I can show you the other thing that I meant. Uh, let's see, street maps. Okay, so if I go back to preview mode, uh, the other thing about the image thing is you'll notice um, when we were in the map mode, you could see a, a pointer and it had lines going off in the direction to where the other points were. Um, if you're using the image mode, it does not have those lines. So this is another subtle difference. It's like we're focused on the here and now of this point, not which points it connects to in different directions. So it's a little more focused on what you're looking at as the map and the image and the text that go with it and less about how it connects to other things. It's all coming back to me now that I'm talking. About it. <laughs> um, and like I said, again, it has this sort of odd little feature up in the upper right corner. So they are pretty subtle differences, but it's like a question of do you want to see lines on the navigation between points on the map or not? Um, and you can notice if I'm not hovering directly over the map, those points disappear. So if you were using custom images, they wouldn't, you wouldn't, they kind of wouldn't be cluttered by things if you're not hovering over them. So it's basically, it's similar enough, but it's like, how do we take some of the intrusive elements out of looking at just images as the storytelling element as opposed to the storyline tool um which tells uh tells the story basically um through lines <laughs> and and line charts um so like this is storyline no pictures just text and dots on a line so it's just a different depending on it's thinking about how you want to represent and share that story so I'm sorry it took my brain that long to get to that answer. I did know the differences, but, um, but yeah, so. Um, okay. Any last questions or we can wrap up early because I know this is a long session compared to, I think what a lot of other things have been the last couple of days. Um, but I appreciate everybody joining. Um, I hope you have an opportunity to explore some of these tools. Um, they're, they're not scary and they can be a lot of fun. Um, and I will also put my email in chat. Um, I'm always happy to talk about them. I probably have some other resources I can share from some teaching some longer workshop, workshops about these, but I'm happy to answer questions if you have them. But otherwise, bye everybody.